What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord and to be assembled together with those of like precious faith to worship God in spirit and in truth. I want to encourage you to have your Bible open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. We're going to be looking really at one verse today, uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, but if you'd be patient with me, I'd like to make uh, mention of a few things uh, before we get started with our study. Had a very good week this past week in Barnesville, Ohio, working with the West Main Street Church there in a gospel meeting, a small town over in eastern Ohio, just near the Appalachian Mountains, lots of hills and curves there. Uh, one of the older members there took me around and showed me around. I think I went through five counties in one day, just out driving around, making a, a, a small circle, but got to see a lot of God's beautiful creation, rolling hills and, and uh, small farms and things like that. Uh, good, strong church there in that area. It has a strong history, uh, but they're serving the Lord there. Uh, doing the Lord's work in a small town has challenges to it, and they're, they're facing those challenges there. But good, faithful brethren there, and got to spend the week with Brother Jacob Leach. He worshiped with us for a couple of years very recently as he was finishing up a law degree at University of Dayton. And it was good to be with him and with his family uh, during that time. So big changes taking place here this past week while I was away. If we could adapt 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, for we park by faith and not by sight. I'm sure lines will be painted uh, on the parking lot very soon. They, they still have another coat to put on, I understand, and then uh, painting some lines. Uh, but it's, it's coming along, uh, and we're very thankful for that. Appreciate that. Next Sunday morning, in the 11 o'clock hour, I plan to preach a, a sermon uh, that I've never preached before. I've done back-to-school sermons before, as school has started up, but I've never done a schools-out sermon before. But I'm going to do that next Sunday. School is going to be coming to an end. I don't know about our young people. That was my favorite time of the year. Uh, some homeschoolers have already quit school uh, for the year. They're already finished, but those in public school uh, within the next couple of weeks, school will be letting out. Uh, vacation time is coming. Summer vacation time is coming. Uh, what are some unique opportunities and unique challenges that come during that time of the year? Let's talk about that next Sunday morning. School is out. And a couple of serious matters to bring to our attention. Uh, last fall, Brother Josh McKibben held our gospel meeting. He has been very ill the last few months, and I noticed on his Facebook page just this past week, he's been diagnosed with something that's got a, a name to it that I, I can't recall and can't pronounce but I believe it is some type of a cancer that has eaten away at some of his bones. He's broken a couple of his ribs, one of his vertebra. I do remember him writing and saying that his bones look like they are moth-eaten. Very serious condition. Let's be praying for him, for his wife, his two daughters, for their family. Let's be praying diligently for them. As was announced this past week, Josh Lee's wife, Christy, uh, went in for a biopsy. They're awaiting the results of that early this coming week. Let's be praying for Josh and for Christy and for their family as well. And several of us noticed a few moments ago uh, that Christina and Evelyn got up and left. Uh, Christina is taking Evelyn to the emergency room right now. Uh, she was having some tics. Her heart rate was increased, uh, and that's uh, symptomatic of something that Evelyn needed to be taken to the emergency room for. So we'll be praying for her as well. Uh, let's be praying for Evelyn and for Christina as well. Lots of opportunities here lately to be praying uh, for our brethren and praying for each other. And let's be busy doing that. Mark 16 and verse 16. 
has got to be one of the most neglected, misunderstood, misused, and denied passages in the Bible. It's been my observation that a lot of denominational folks don't want to touch it. I've got some commentaries I've looked at in the past that when it comes to Mark 16 and verse 16 and making a comment on what Jesus says here, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Interested in, in, in seeing what they've got to say about this passage, a lot of them will say this is in a section of the Gospel of Mark that doesn't appear in some manuscripts, and so they don't talk about it. They won't even address it. They'll skip over it altogether. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. There are popular teachings, popular doctrines and beliefs and practices that go against this clear teaching of Jesus. And I want to take a look at them. I, I'm going to look at five views of Mark 16, verse 16. This is a, an old outline that's been around for a long time, a good first principle type of lesson. But it may be this morning you hear some things for the first time. And we hope so. I hope that you'll pay attention as we, we take a look and we study how it is that this passage needs to be understood and how we need to take the Lord's words at face value, trusting that He means what He says. We're going to look at five views. The first one would be held by those who don't profess to be Christians, don't profess to be believers uh, in Christ, but I want to take a look at it anyway. This would be the view, he who believes and is baptized will not be saved. Well, no one is saying that, but, but who is it that holds the view that would have our Lord's words read this way? Well, atheists, for one. Atheists don't believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They don't believe in heaven or hell, condemnation or salvation. So you can believe and you can be baptized all you want to. You're not going to be saved. Well, there is a God. And there is a divine Savior. There is a hell to be shunned and there is a heaven to be gained. Psalm chapter 14 and at verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Evidence abounds showing us that God is real. The second group would be those who adhere to different world religions like the Jews and the Muslims, the Hindus, and the Buddhists. They believe in God, or they believe in a God, or a plurality of gods, but they do not believe that salvation is found in Jesus Christ. However, the Scriptures make it very clear that salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. Jesus says so Himself in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. In Acts chapter 4 and at verse 12, when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin and they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ any longer, Acts chapter 4 and at verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I would hope that there's no one here who holds this view, that you can believe and you can be baptized all you want. There is no salvation for anyone. We know that the Bible teaches just the opposite. Here's another view of Mark 16, 16. He who does not believe and is not baptized will still be saved, will be saved. Who would hold a view like this? Who would have Mark 16, 16 read this way? This would be the view of those who are universalists. Universalism is the doctrine that all souls will eventually find salvation in the grace of God. God is love, and because God is love, God is not going to condemn anyone. Everyone is ultimately going to be saved. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter what they believe. Everyone is going to be saved. That sounds great. That sounds great. It would be great if that was true. 
But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, in fact, that few are going to be saved. That's what Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. That, that is, many are on their way to destruction because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Well, here the universalist says everyone is going to be saved. Jesus says, no, only a few are going to be saved. Are you one of the few? Well, that's up to you. That's up to whether or not you will be honest with our Lord's words. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that the wrath of God is coming upon those who sin. There will be some who will suffer the wrath of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Yeah, universalism sounds great. Everyone is going to be saved. And what the Bible says is those are empty words of deception. The truth is that God's wrath is going to be poured out on those who are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which means those who do not accept salvation in Jesus Christ are going to be lost. Well, most of our Bible-believing friends that, that are round about us would never treat Mark 16.16 16 in, in these first two ways that we've looked at. But the next two that we're going to look at are going to strike a little bit closer to home. How about Mark 16, 16, reading this way? He who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. This would be the interpretation that would be forced on this verse from those who practice infant baptism. The sprinkling of infants is an indication that faith is not essential to salvation. When a, when a baby is being sprinkled, baptized by their parents, it's not the baby's choice. The baby has no faith at all. It's something that is done to the child at a time when the child won't even remember it being done. People practice this. Many people practice this. And they're very sincere in practicing this. But it's contrary to many passages of Scripture. Number one, the Bible teaches that faith is a necessary prerequisite, number one, for baptism. There can be no scriptural baptism without a confession of faith. Look in the book of Acts at chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, here we read of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip is sent and he sees the chariot with the eunuch and, and comes near and hears him reading from the prophet Isaiah. Asked, do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone guides me is the response. And he's invited up into the chariot. And so Philip, uh, um, let's look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? What's keeping me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the next verse continues. What is it that kept him from being baptized scripturally? He, Philip had to hear his confession of faith. Infants are precious, babies are precious, but they cannot confess their faith. There's no scriptural grounds for baptizing them. Also, faith is a necessary prerequisite to salvation. In the book of Romans, at chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, 
you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Babies cannot believe and they cannot confess. Babies can't do this. Now, one way Calvinists get around this is by insisting that God gives the gift of faith to infants. I had an exchange with a Lutheran pastor when we were living in Edna, Texas, and he, he was convinced that it was scriptural to baptize infants because God gave them the gift of faith. I don't read of that anywhere in Scripture. Faith, as a matter of fact, right here in chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. There's been many a baby who has heard the Word of God right here in this building. I know that's true because I listen to sermons that were preached decades ago, and I hear babies crying in those sermons. See, it's not just something that's happened recently. It's, that's something that's been happening all along, and it's a wonderful sound. It's a wonderful sound. But those babies are not comprehending the Word of God. They're developing great habits in being brought to services, but they're not comprehending and understanding the Word of God. Not until they come to that age of accountability do they do that. So, faith is a prerequisite to baptism and to salvation. Here's another problem with infant baptism. Sprinkling is not baptism. Sprinkling is not the scriptural mode of baptism. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, reinforces what we just read in Acts chapter 8, where, where Philip takes the eunuch and they stop the chariot and they, they get down and they go down into the water and he baptizes him and brings him up out of the water. That is the action of baptism. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. These sincere, well-meaning parents who have their babies sprinkled and call it baptism know good and well what a burial is. If you ask them to bury something, they wouldn't take it out in the backyard and drop a handful of dirt over it. To bury something, you've got to dig a hole, you've got to put it down, and you've got to cover it up completely. That happens with immersion. Baptism by divine ordination is patterned after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is there at our Lord's death that we contact the blood that He shed, that blood that can forgive us of our sins. Sprinkling or pouring wasn't practiced at baptism until centuries after the Lord and His apostles lived. Baptizing infants is without scriptural authority. I would say to you, if you're with us today, and that's the baptism that you have undergone, I hope that you would give serious thought, prayerful thought and study to the things that we have just talked about. Jesus did not say, he who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. And then fourth, he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. This is the very popular view held by those who believe in faith-only salvation. That's a very popular doctrine. The Methodist discipline says that it is full of comfort, but it's not according to what Jesus said in Mark 16 and at verse 16. One who teaches faith-only salvation believes that you are saved before and without baptism. Matter of fact, that they would, they would go so far as to say, you are saved the moment that you believe, and you should be baptized, but you don't have to be baptized. Yes, you should be baptized because the Lord commands you to be baptized, but you don't have to be baptized. Does that make any sense to you 
Because it doesn't make any sense to me. The Lord commands us to do something, but we don't have to do it. We should, but we don't have to do it. We can still be saved. No, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make bad sense. It sure doesn't make good sense. What, what is the purpose of baptism? Well, the, the immediate response that I've often gotten is that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. It's something that you do to show the world that you are a believer, but it has no spiritual impact upon you at all. Or it's something that you do just to join a denomination. Once again, I do not deny the sincerity of people who believe this. I once did. I once believed this. But it's wrong. Jesus and His apostles taught differently. For one thing, Jesus and His apostles taught that faith only cannot save. Go with me back to the Gospel of Matthew at chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7 and at verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Notice the first would be someone who believes in Jesus, calling Him Lord. But they're not entering into heaven because they haven't done the will of the Father in heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who just believes but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In the book of Hebrews at chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus has secured our salvation by being obedient. Because Jesus was obedient even unto death, you and I have the forgiveness of our sins. That's possible for us. Look here, Hebrews chapter Five, look at verses 8 and 9. Though He was a son, the H and the S are capitalized. It's talking about Jesus. Though He was a son, yet He learned obedience by the things which He suffered. And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. That's what the Hebrew text says. Now, I know that salvation is available to those who believe Him. We've got many verses that teach that. But none of them say believe only. None of them say faith only. But this passage says eternal salvation is available to those who obey Him. Did you know that even though faith only is a very popular doctrine, the only place in the Bible where the words faith only are found together is in James chapter 2 and verse 24. And it doesn't say faith only saves. James chapter 2 verse 24 says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So faith only, salvation, faith only cannot save. Here's something else we need to understand, and that is the purpose of water baptism. It is not an outward sign of an inward grace. It's not just something that we do because we should in following our Lord's example or just to do it to join a local church. No, God has a greater design in mind for the purpose of baptism. Baptism is for the forgiveness of our sins. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, as Peter is preaching the gospel for the first time after our Lord's ascension into heaven, he's preaching to Jews, and he tells them in verse 36, Acts 2 and at verse 30, 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Why were they cut to the heart? Because they, right here for the first time, came to understand and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If they weren't believers, their hearts would not be cut. So they're believing. They have faith. And they ask, what shall we do? If faith only saves, this would have been a perfect time for Peter to clarify this and say, nothing, nothing. You believe, you're saved. 
But that's not how he responds. Then Peter said to them, who's the them? These believers, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See what baptism is for? For the remission of sins, in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. Let's turn to Acts 22 and verse 16. I want you to see this in your own Bible. See it for yourself. That's one of the things that convinced me. When when I was in denominationalism, and I didn't believe these truths, I looked them up in my own Bible. I saw them in my own Bible. Acts 22, and at verse 16, here Ananias comes to Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes the Apostle Paul. Now Saul of Tarsus has seen the Lord on the road to Damascus. He's seen the resurrected Lord. So he believes. And he's been three days without eating or drinking. He's as penitent and as sorrowful as anyone has ever been. But notice, Ananias comes to him in verse 16. Acts 22, verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What is the purpose for water baptism? It has been said that the Bible has been written at a grade school level, that someone in grade school can read and understand the Bible. What's refreshing is to take a passage like Acts 22, verse 16, hand it to a grade schooler, and ask them what baptism is for. And they'll tell you, baptism is for the washing away of your sins. It is that simple. It is that simple. If Saul was saved on the road to Damascus, and that's what those who believe in faith-only salvation say, because that's the corner that their false doctrine pushes them into. If if you're saved at the moment that you believe, then, then he enters into Damascus. Saul enters Damascus as a saved man. But if that's true, he's the only saved person that you and I have ever heard of who still had his sins. Because when Ananias came to him, he said, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He who believes and is not baptized will be saved. That's the false doctrine of those who believe and teach faith only salvation. There's one other view that I know of that can be taken of Mark 16 and verse 16, and that is to just take it at face value. I remember when I became a Christian. It was August 4th, 1988. I just turned 17 years old. My entire life, as far back as I could remember, I knew about the Bible. It's God and God's inspired Word, and I knew about Jesus, His Son, the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins. I knew about heaven and I knew about hell. But I'd spent most of my teenage years trying to get Baptist doctrine to fit in the Bible and, and trying to, to wrestle between the two of those. And I'll re- I remember that when I first became a Christian, how refreshing it was to just let the Bible say what the Bible says. And that's the proper view to take with Mark 16 and verse 16. Jesus means what He says. He who believes, believes what? That Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for our sins, and that He rose again the third day. That's, the, that's the, the gospel that we have received according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He who believes and is baptized, immersed in water, like that unit in Acts chapter 8, will be saved. Notice where the Lord puts salvation. Not before baptism. The Lord, who is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. We read that verse, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. He's the author. He wrote it. Where did He put salvation? Before baptism? No. The Lord put salvation after baptism. And it's as easy as an addition problem. The the word and is a conjunction. It joins two things together. He who believes and is baptized will be equals salvation. 
He who believes and is baptized will be saved. It is that easy. Well, one reaction, one response that we will get is, if baptism was essential, it would be mentioned in the second part of the verse. Jesus would have said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. Well, let's address that for just a moment. In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, John chapter 3 and at verse 18, John chapter 3, you know verse 16, we'll go just two verses later, verse 18. John 3 and at verse 18, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Remember that belief, faith, is a prerequisite to baptism. Without faith, baptism doesn't mean anything. And if you don't believe, you're not going to repent. You're not going to confess. You're not going to be baptized. You're not going to live a faithful life. If you don't take that first step, there's no, no point in mentioning other steps if you don't take the first step. So he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe, there's no salvation there. No salvation there whatsoever. But how easy, how refreshing it is to just let the Lord's words mean what they say. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. It's one thing to understand this verse. It's another thing to do it. I ask this afternoon, are you a believer in Christ? If so, that is good. But will you follow through and do what the Lord has said for you to do to be saved? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Maybe you'd like to study about this some more. Maybe you'd like to learn a little bit more about this. Then would you let me know? I want to tell you, there's nothing I'd rather do this week than spend some time with you studying the Bible and helping you understand and to have every question answered and know what you have to do in order to be saved. But maybe you've already arrived at that point in your life, and you know what you need to do, and you know you need to do it. Well, the baptistry is ready. It's ready if you're ready. Are you ready to obey the gospel? Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?